United States of America in the first half of the 19th century. A frontier moving relentlessly westward across the North American continent. A surge of energy as great as any in history. A tide of humanity spreading out across the land. It would not let up until it reached the shores of the Pacific. And even then, men looked ever westward, across the huge ocean to the great markets of China and the rest of Asia. A tremendous new source of wealth and goods, American products to be sold and tea and silks to be bought for the young nation's multiplying millions. China is a great empire, extending over a great part of the world. The rising sun looks upon the great mountains and great rivers of China. When he sets, he looks upon rivers and mountains equally large in the United States. I shall be the first recognized agent from a civilized power to reside in Japan. I hope I may so conduct myself that I may have honorable mention in the histories which will be written on Japan and its future destiny. Who does not see that the Pacific Ocean, its, its islands, and the vast regions beyond will become the chief theater of events in the world's great hereafter? This is Commodore Matthew C. Perry of the United States Navy, as seen by a Japanese artist in 1854. To an American artist at about the same time, he looked like this. And to his countrymen, he was renowned as a great naval warrior and diplomat. Although best remembered for his trip to Japan, Perry earlier helped found the state of Liberia for freed American slaves and commanded the Africa Squadron which hunted down slave traders along the African coast. He became a national hero during the war with Mexico and was an ardent exponent of the popular belief that it was the nation's manifest destiny to stretch from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Man and woman were not more formed for union by the hand of God than Texas and the United States are formed for union by the hand of nature. 1845, the annexation of the Texas Republic is approved by Congress. That same year, James K. Polk becomes president on a platform of national expansion. Our title to Oregon is clear and unquestionable. And already, our people are preparing to perfect that title by occupying it with their wives and children. <laughs> Polk risks war with England to acquire undisputed claim to the Oregon Territory, already so populous it becomes a state within 15 years. In California as well, American settlers arrive in such numbers, it is only a matter of time before they will exceed the small Spanish population. Mexican rule is minimal, and many expect California will soon join the United States by default. But then, the U.S. goes to war with Mexico over the Texas boundary, a war welcomed by militant expansionists. And when it is over, the entire Southwest belongs to the United States. The march to the Pacific is accomplished. The trade of Asia beckons. July 8, 1853. Commodore Perry arrives off the shores of Japan carrying with him a personal letter from President Fillmore to the Emperor. Many of our ships now pass every year between California and China. Storms and winds may cause them to be wrecked on your shores. And we ask your kindness for our men and protection for our property. We wish that our people may be permitted to trade with your people. Your empire has a great abundance of coal. This is an article which our steamships must use. 
they would be glad that a harbor in your empire should be appointed. The appearance of Perry's black ships in Tokyo Bay causes turmoil in the city. Japanese newspapers describe their arrival in detail and give elaborate orders to the forces of each feudal lord for the defense of Tokyo from barbarian attack. The entire bay is surrounded and fortified, and Perry is denied permission to land. He employs the same strategy in return. I determined to practice upon them a little of their own diplomacy by forbidding the admission of a single individual on board any of the ships until they declared their rank and the business on which they came. I was well aware that the more exclusive I should make myself, and the more exacting I would be, the more respect these people of forms and ceremonies would be disposed to award me. For the last 200 years, Nagasaki has been the only place where foreign ships touched Japan. There, vessels flying the Dutch flag were allowed to visit annually and exchange goods. A year before, a Dutch ship brought a message that Perry would be coming. But it reached only a few officials who chose to ignore it. The War of Nerves lasts five days. The Japanese know they do not have the force to attack Perry's ships. Perry dares not land for fear of being overwhelmed by sheer numbers. On the sixth day, the Japanese reach a decision. It will be best to arrange the affair quietly, to give the foreigners the supplies they may need, and to receive the letter from their president. We may tell the envoy he had better go away, and in a short time he will get a definite answer. Perry is allowed to land. Excellent discipline on both sides prevents violence, although warriors are stationed beneath the floor of the hall where Perry is received with orders to kill the Commodore if fighting breaks out. Business relating to foreign country must be transacted at Nagasaki. Therefore, as the letter has been received, you can depart. Perry announces he will be back the following spring to receive the Emperor's reply. When he returns, he finds the Japanese ready. Upon landing, I was received by a party of Japanese officials and conducted to the hall prepared for the conference. The Imperial government has decided to concede more than was anticipated, but I hold out for a specific treaty. Perry brings with him many gifts. But in fact, just one, the Industrial Revolution. We have established a magnetic telegraph on the land almost as perfect as any in the world, a mile in direct line, by which words in English, Dutch, and Japanese have already been conveyed. Their disbelieving hosts test the telegraph by racing their swiftest runners against transmitted messages, an inevitably frustrating experience. We have laid down the entire railroad track sent from the United States and put the steam engine, tender and car in excellent practical operation. It can be seen from the ship, flying round its circular path, exciting the utmost wonder. An ancient feudal culture comes into contact with a young, industrializing nation, producing unforeseen and dramatic consequences for both. Within 50 years, Japan will be one of the leading industrial nations of the world and the strongest military power in Asia. From the first of the next month, water, coal, and other things that American ships may need can be had at Nagasaki. And after five years, another port shall be opened. Agreed. But one or more ports must be substituted for Nagasaki. The Americans will never submit to the restrictions imposed upon the Dutch and Chinese. And any further allusion to such restraints will be considered offensive. Shipwrecked men will be sent to Nagasaki. It being impossible to ascertain who are pirates and who are not, they shall not be allowed to walk about. 
It is altogether inconsistent with justice that persons thrown by providence upon the shores of a friendly nation should be treated as pirates without any proof. In the end, Perry gets the treaty and wins most of his demands. Two years later, Townsend Harris will establish the first American consulate in Japan. No more slave states, no more slave territory. We did not acquire the Western lands to spread the curse of the slave power. Slavery, the national shame which led Thomas Jefferson to write, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. In 1808, Congress prohibited the further importation of slaves, and in 1820 declared it piracy, punishable by death. But the slave trade continues to flourish, even after a joint British-American squadron is sent to patrol the African coast. By mid-century, the national debate over slavery has become so intense that some southern states openly threaten to leave the Union. With equal passion, their opponents argue that slavery must be abolished and resist the introduction of slaves into the new Western territories. In 1860, Abraham Lincoln is elected president after campaigning against the spread of slavery. South Carolina announces its secession from the Union and Fort Sumter is attacked. The Civil War has begun. It is a titanic struggle. Over 600,000 men will die before it is over, and great parts of the land will be laid waste. From it, a much different nation will emerge. Now, American attention shifts to the Atlantic Ocean. The North institutes a naval blockade of the Confederacy, and is accused by the British and French of violating their rights as neutrals. The British respond by recognizing the Confederacy as a belligerent, and Lincoln fears recognition of Southern independence may follow. The Confederacy sends two agents to Europe to seek recognition and economic support. They travel on the British steamer Trent, which is confronted on the high seas by a northern warship. The Confederate agents are removed and taken into custody. The British are outraged. And for a brief moment, war with England seems possible. It is the duty of our government to demand the immediate return of the gentlemen stolen under our flag and to prepare for a refusal by sending a naval force adequate to destroy the Federal Navy and blockade all the chief northern ports. President Lincoln ends the crisis by an act of high statesmanship. We must stick to American principles concerning the rights of neutral and thus forever bind Great Britain to acknowledge that she has been wrong for 60 years. He orders the release of the southern agents and allows them to continue their voyage, admitting that their seizure was a violation of the same neutral rights for which we fought in the War of 1812. September 17, 1862. After a series of stunning victories on battlefields between Richmond and Washington, the Confederates are stopped at Antietam in the bloodiest day of the war. It is not a northern victory, but it is enough to put an end to a British plan to intervene on behalf of the South. Four days later, President Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing all slaves in those areas still in rebellion against the United States. The U.S. Minister to Great Britain, Charles Francis Adams, is elated. The Emancipation Proclamation has done more for us than all our former victories and all our diplomacy. It is creating an almost convulsive reaction in our favor all over England. But private British shipyards still agree to build warships for the Confederacy, ships which take a terrible toll of northern naval and merchant vessels. Adams conducts an unremitting campaign to keep the British neutral and make them pay for northern losses. Finally, ending the last major diplomatic crisis of the war, the Foreign Secretary issues an order blocking the delivery of any more warships. April 9th, 1865. The great Southern General Robert E. Lee surrenders to General Grant, and the Civil War is virtually over. 
Five days later, Abraham Lincoln becomes one of its last casualties. The nation mourns his assassination and wearily turns to the painful task of reconstructing the shattered Union. It is a task which allows little time for involvement in the world beyond our borders. We have separated ourselves so completely from the affairs of other people that it is difficult to imagine how large a place they occupied when the government was founded. Yet the years that follow bring changes so revolutionary that the United States is on the verge of being forced by its own momentum to play a larger role in world affairs. In 1866, the Atlantic Cable goes into operation, linking the United States and Europe by telegraph. Passenger steamers are now making the transatlantic crossing in eight days. They are part of a communications and transportation revolution destined to end American remoteness from Europe. The Atlantic Ocean is no longer a barrier. The North American continent is a rich storehouse of raw materials for spectacular industrial growth. By 1900, Americans will mine more coal and iron, forge more steel, lay more tracks, build more factories than any other nation on Earth. To many around the world, the United States is the land of promise and opportunity. By the end of the century, the population has grown from 31 to 76 million, enlarging the cities and spreading out across the nation. As rural America becomes urban America, social unrest inevitably follows, the result of a dramatic national transformation into one of the world's leading industrial powers. And now again, talk of territorial expansion can be heard. Since the Civil War, Alaska is the only new territory to enter the Union. Now a new generation of leaders emerges, convinced that America's prosperity represents a call to further national growth. They support the establishment of a joint protectorate over Samoa and champion the annexation of the Hawaiian Islands. 1896, William McKinley is elected president, and with him come to power the ambitious young men who foresee a new manifest destiny. McKinley inherits a new American Navy, a white fleet, built to symbolize the new sense of national pride. To no one are they more satisfying than to McKinley's Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt. McKinley reverses the policy of his predecessor and agrees to the annexation of Hawaii, attacked by its opponents as a shotgun marriage, arranged for American business interests. A campaign to free Cuba from oppressive Spanish rule is launched by the two leading newspaper syndicates who feature vivid descriptions of concentration camps, starvation, disease, and torture. Pressure to go to war with Spain builds steadily in the press and on Capitol Hill. For a time, President McKinley resists those pressures. But then on February 15, 1898, the United States battleship Maine is destroyed by an explosion in Havana Harbor. 260 Americans are killed. A naval court of inquiry blames the explosion on an underwater mine, but says it is unable to determine who is responsible. However, to most Americans, there is little doubt. In the press, Spain is depicted as the brutal murderer of American sons and husbands, and the call to arms becomes impossible to resist. President McKinley reverses his peace policy and asks Congress to approve a war resolution. It is an unequal contest. Admiral Dewey's Asian squadron hastens to the Philippine Islands under urgent orders drafted by Theodore Roosevelt. In seven hours, the Spanish fleet protecting Manila is destroyed. A month later, United States troops and Filipino guerrillas take over the islands. Another segment of the new American fleet sets up a blockade of Cuba, and in June, an expeditionary force lands near Santiago. It includes a volunteer regiment, organized by now Lieutenant Colonel Roosevelt, which soon becomes known as the Rough Riders. 
By July, Santiago is surrounded, and the Spanish fleet is forced to try for the open sea. Four hours later, it too is destroyed. The brief war is virtually over. In the Caribbean, another Spanish possession, Puerto Rico, also is occupied with almost no resistance. A nationwide anti-imperialist league is formed. It equates European efforts to carve up China with what it calls the new American imperialism. It condemns proposals to keep any of the occupied territories as colonialism, a European evil which Americans fought a revolution to avoid. In August, a protocol of peace is signed at the White House, which leads to a treaty giving Cuba its independence and ceding Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines to the United States. When Philippine guerrilla leader Aguinaldo learns the terms of the treaty, he calls upon his countrymen to declare their independence and begins a campaign of massive guerrilla resistance. The United States responds by sending an expeditionary force to subdue the guerrillas. In the Senate, another of the great foreign policy debates in American history is joined. This is the saddest and most unhappy mistake our beloved country has made since the day we began to traffic in slaves. American opposition to the war has been the chief factor in prolonging it. The Filipinos will never be content until we allow them to govern themselves. A lasting peace can be secured only by overwhelming forces and ceaseless action until universal and absolutely final defeat is inflicted upon the enemy. After three years, the fighting ends and the debate subsides. The United States is now a Pacific power. And at the State Department, Secretary of State John Hay is under pressure to use that power to keep American trade with China open and growing. China's disintegration at the hands of the European powers has been accelerating at an appalling rate. Russia, Germany and France attempt to close the door to any further trade agreements with China to protect their own special advantages. Great Britain, Japan and the United States oppose them. Secretary Hay sends a circular letter to all nations with interests in China, requesting formal assurances that trade will remain open to all. The next year, foreign troops put down a revolt by Chinese reactionaries. The final division of China into colonies seems possible, and Hay, in a second circular note, expands his open-door policy to guarantee the territorial integrity of China. In the 1900 presidential campaign, imperialism is one of the major issues. McKinley's running mate is Rough Rider Theodore Roosevelt, who becomes president only 10 months after the election when McKinley is assassinated. Roosevelt remains an undaunted champion of the controlled use of American power and becomes known for a diplomatic style he describes as speak softly and carry a big stick. Before his first term ends, work has begun on a canal across Panama, fulfilling a dream going back to the time of Balboa, spurred on by the growth of Asian trade. The canal is started after Panama breaks away from Colombia, which it had joined nearly a century before. Roosevelt is accused of encouraging the rebellion, and a U.S. warship is known to have sent Marines ashore to defend it. Roosevelt also launches a series of economic and military interventions in other parts of Central America and the Caribbean, and adds a new corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Chronic wrongdoing in the Western Hemisphere may force the United States, however reluctantly, to the exercise of an international police power. Latin Americans see the corollary as a violation of their sovereignty, justification for economic and political imperialism. And indeed, in the years that follow, American interventions south of the border are given the name dollar diplomacy, leaving behind a legacy of ill will toward the powerful neighbor to the north. Although Roosevelt was often attacked for his aggressive diplomacy, 
he also clearly established an American interest in the promotion of world peace. In 1905, Russia and Japan go to war over their conflicting interests in Manchuria, a threat to the new open-door policy. Roosevelt intervenes with a request to both sides to respect the neutrality and sovereignty of China. That same year at the Portsmouth Navy Yard, Japanese and Russian representatives meet under Roosevelt's mediation to end the war and to sign a treaty of peace without victory. For his efforts, Roosevelt is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. The next year, Morocco becomes the focus of international rivalries which threaten to explode into a general European war. Germany asks Roosevelt to arrange an international conference. The result, at Algeciras, Spain, the great powers of Europe meet with the American delegates and reach a settlement. But European tensions and rivalries remain so acute that many believe the continent still is on the verge of a great and catastrophic war. One international peace conference has already been held at The Hague in the Netherlands. In 1907, a second Hague conference is called. President Roosevelt sends an American delegation instructed to seek the establishment of a world court to handle international disputes. They are not successful. And on the whole, the conference must be judged a failure. None of the nations present are willing to reduce their military establishments or to accept any other limitations on their sovereign rights. The supremacy of the British Navy is the best security for the peace of the world. Dehumanizing of war. You might just as well talk of humanizing hell. To be rich, aggressive, and yet helpless in war is to invite destruction. Beating empty air is always a tiresome job. Europe continues to march to the drumbeat of impending disaster. No other generation has witnessed changes as revolutionary as those which transform the rural republic of Abraham Lincoln into the industrial giant of Theodore Roosevelt. A new world power has emerged between the two oceans, a North American nation strong enough to command attention in both Europe and Asia. The oceans are no longer vast barriers between continents, but rather great waterways for ever-increasing travel and trade. The lives of men all over the globe are slowly being woven together. Nevertheless, most Americans still oppose any responsibility for the world's affairs. But this would soon become inevitable. If we are to be a really great people, we must strive in good faith to play a great part in the world. The 20th century looms before us, big 